Islam. I welcome Dr. Shahidu, please come over and start your presentation. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to all to this presentation. I am Dr. Mahmoud Islam going to present my case. A two year, two months old child, uh, weighing 11 kg man child, presented uh, to us with history of fever and respiratory distress for three days, bluish discoloration, and patient received in the emergency room with interpreted state. On ex examination, patient was severely sinus, having uh, clubbing. First and second half sound audible, but no cardiac murmur based on vesicular and cystic gluey in the left lower chest. And echo, there is no uh, shunt lesion as well as no valvular lesion with a normal cardiac size chamber and good biventricular function. But contrast echocardiography shows that bubble contrast appeared in the left heart after three cardiac cycles, that indicating pulmonary arteriovenous malformation. As the patient was in uh, mechanical ventilation, but uh, severe hypoxia and severe metabolic acidosis are persisted, and the patient developed a bradycardia for several times, even required CPR. So, emergency CT pulmonary angiogram was done, and then the patient was shifted to the cardiac lab for uh, emergency management. In CT pulmonary angiogram, uh, there was multiple left sided arteriovenous malformation predominant to the left lower lobe with a dilated. LPA and the left pulmonary veins, and right uh, RK angiogram was normal. So, this is the coronal as well as the axial view uh, showing there is a multiple uh, left sided arterial fistula most uh, on the left lower lobe. And the CT scan of the brain was normal. In cardiac angiogram, this is the uh, LPA graphic showing there is multiple arterial malformation uh, involving the uh, or left lung, which is uh, more confined in the left lower lobe. This is a major uh, uh, feeder vessel. So we occluded this vessel with a 14 millimeter vascular plug, but still there was a residual arteriovenous malformation, and patients uh, still uh, patient was cyanosis, and the saturation was less than 60 percent. So we occluded the origin of the LPA. And um, uh, there was no uh, arteriovenous malfunction seen in the left side, and the situation was uh, significantly improved. So we occluded the origin of the left pulmonary artery with a 14 millimeter vascular plug, 24 millimeter vascular plug, and uh, the patient saturation became 97 percent. So patient was extubated on second day of procedure, and the patient was discharged on the sixth day of procedure with aspirin. And immunization uh, with the pneumococcal influenza vaccine and follow up plan as the patient may require left sided pneumonectomy in future. So, pulmonary artery venous malformation is a direct communication between the branches of the right the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary veins bypassing the capillary bed. And incidence is two to three per uh, lakh, one lakh population uh, with the female predominance. And is a presentation we want to 70 years, but majority of the patients are diagnosed at the first three decades of life. Most of the patients are congenital, and uh, eighty percent uh, and eighty percent of congenital PFP is due to the hereditary uh, uh, hemorrhagic telangiectasia, which is an autosomal dominant disease. Pulmonary APM may be single or multiple, and most of them are single, and left lower lobe being the most common location. About 13 to 55 percent are asymptomatic, but uh, symptoms are dyspnea, hysteresis, hemoptysis, palpitation, chest pain, and cough. In X ray, round or oval shaped mass of uniform density, frequently lobulated, two thirds are located in the lower lobe. In contrast echocardiography, bubble will be visualized in the left atrium after three to eight cardiac cycle after their appearance in the right atrium. And contrast enhanced uh, CT is a valuable tool in diagnosis and define the vascular anatomy of PMVM. And pulmonary angiogram is a gold standard in the diagnosis of PMVM, define the angio architecture of the pulmonary vas vasculature, which is necessary before the therapeutic embolization or surgical intersection. 
The indication of treatment is this, when the patient is symptomatic, hypoxia or have one or more PAVM larger than two centimeter, sign of symptom of left to, uh, right to left shaft who anticipate the pregnancy. Asymptomatic patient without hypoxia and with a feeding vessel a diameter less than three millimeter are usually monitored at least 83 years because so most, uh, more, of, uh, more than half of the PAVM appears increasing the size over time. The goal of treatment is the relief of symptom, relief of hypoxia, prevention of complications like hemoplasis, hemothorax, stroke, and brain abscess. Transcatheter coil, muscular plug, or device ambulation has become the treatment of choice in multiple and bilateral articular malformation. And surgery is indicated when there is a failed to response in the embolotherapy, serious uh, bleeding complication, or embolotherapy uh, was not possible. Lung conservation, resection, local resection, or segmentectomy is the posterior of choice. So take home message is the PABM should be considered when the patient's present with exertion or dyspnea, sinusis, and clubbing with normal cardiac examination. A diagnosis of uh, HST has to keep in mind in all uh, PABM. All patients with PABM who are symptomatic need the intervention. Immunotherapy is uh, the treatment of choice nowadays. Lung conservative resection is an optimal treatment for the symptomatic patient when the embolotherapy is not feasible. Regular follow-up is needed to detect the recurrence of lesion. Thank you. Yeah, I think Shubhadeep, we can move to the next case. Yeah, yeah, sure. So for our next case, I uh, invite uh, Dr. Soni Kumari. She's our first year uh, post DNB uh, resident. She's a postdoctoral fellow in pediatric cardiology. Good afternoon. Uh, my topic is evaluation of tachycardia in a structurally normal heart. So we have to look, suspect, and investigate. Uh, so the case is five-year-old girl, female child. Uh, she was a student of elementary school without apparent structural heart disease. Was admitted to our PICU with complaints of a racing heart and significant weight loss. She was evaluated for same complaints in the past one year back. Uh, all investigation in the past was normal uh, earlier in view of sinus tach tachycardia. And it was found to be normal. So earlier patient was labeled as inappropriate sinus tachycardia and was started on evaporating. But due to the poor patient, well, the patient was non-compliant and so uh, did not uh, continue on treatment. On examination, the on examination patient uh, has weight, uh, weight by age was less than minus three standard deviation. And weight by height was minus one standard deviation to minus two standard deviation. See, uh, the patient had a smooth and plus skin with excessive sweating, exophthalmus, and prominent thyroid gland. The patient underwent a complete physical examination, laboratory analysis, CBC, CRP, serum procal, thyroid profile, plasma free metanephrine levels, chest x ray, ECG, and uh, 2D echocardiography. Uh, this was the ECG of the patient. He had a uh, long lead, uh, lead two ECG was suggestive of a uh, It was ECG suggestive of sinus rhythm with normal axis with a heart rate of 164 beat per minute. And uh, every means it was a sinus rhythm. Every P wave was for uh, means every QRS lead is followed by I mean, every P wave is followed by a QRS rhythm. P wave is 100 millisecond, PR interval 130 millisecond, QRS duration was 80 millisecond. 
uh, ACG halter monitoring uh, was done and it revealed a sinus rhythm with a frequency of 186 to 218 beats per minute uh, during daily activities. Uh, 2D echo was done and it revealed a structurally normal heart with a good biventricular function. And so in view of tachycardia, in order to control the rate, metoprolol infusion was started and all the investigation which were sent uh, were traced and it was found to be within normal limits. CBC was normal, uh, renal function test was normal, fasting blood sugar was normal, liver profile test, uh, liver function test was normal, uh, CRP, urine routine microscopic uh, was within normal limits, chest x-ray was insignificant. And then came the thyroid profile, which uh, which changed uh, serum free thyroid level was 7.81 nanograms per ml, free T4 was 24.9 micrograms per deciliter, TSH was 0 0.01 mics per international unit per ml. So further, in view of hyperthyroidism, USG thyroid, thyroid receptor anti thyrotropin receptor antibody and anti TPU anti antibody investigations were sent. And uh, USG neck suggestive of bilateral and large thyroid gland with heterogeneous depot texture and increased vascularity. TSS receptor antibody was positive. It was highly positive and there was more than 40 international units per liter. So treatment uh, was started. Antithyroid drugs, uh, methimazole was started and uh, patient uh, was, uh, for, the, uh, for the rate control, patient was shifted to the beta blockers in real. And then patient was referred to a pediatric endocrinologist. So overall, means what do, uh, so the diagnosis was uh, sinus tachycardia. So what do we mean by regular sinus rhythm? That is rhythm is regular and the rate is normal for the age. The two characteristics of a uh, sinus rhythm are that the P wave precedes each QRS complex with a regular PR interval. And uh, the P wave, uh, P wave P axis falls between 0 to 90 degree uh, with the up, upright P waves in lead 2 and uh, inverted P waves in lead AVR. And this is the normal heart rate of a resting heart rate that in newborns it's a, a mean is approx 145 at the six month 145 beats per minute, one year 132, two year 120, four year 108 beats per minute, six years 100 beats per minute, 10 years 90 beats per minute, 14 years, 85 beats per minute. So, so sinus tachycardia in a structurally normal heart uh, uh, should be made by ruling out other causes of sinus tachycardia. Oh, there is uh, one slide has been missed. So what do you mean by sinus tachycardia? A sinus tachycardia means the characteristics of a sinus rhythm is present and the rate is faster than the upper limit of the normal for age. And uh, Causes are hemodynamics, uh, means uh, it can be due to the hypovolemia or sepsis or infection or due to pulmonary embolism or cardiac tamponade. These are uh, cardiogenic uh, acute coronary syndrome or hypoxia. In metabolic, we should rule out fever, hyperthyroid stage, hypo or hyperglycemia, few chromocytoma, and uh, any substance abuse or pain and other causes uh, that uh, are inappropriate sinus tachycardia and anxiety. So the take home message is that sinus tachycardia in a structurally normal heart should be made by ruling out other causes of sinus tachycardia like fever, anxiety, anemia, hypo, hyperglycemia, dehydration, infection, hyperthyroidism, pheochromocytoma, and drug abuse. The underlying cause of sinus tachycardia must be treated and a pediatrician should rule out uh, other causes of sinus tachycardia. So thank you. Uh, if there are no questions, we will move uh, to our next case. We are audible, I hope. Yeah, we are audible. Okay. I think we are shop, uh, both Professor Shaponre is there and also uh, uh, Dr. Shushmitadi is there. Mm -hmm. Shush Shushmitadi, do you have any questions or anything to comment? <coughs> Would it make it a full screen? Yeah. yeah. Okay. But the last, okay. the last presentation had some. Ah, yeah. Can I ask some questions about the first case? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, uh, please. It was a uh, both the cases were very interesting with good take home points. Um, the first case, um, a structurally normal heart. It was said we should suspect the um, 
if the, if the cardiac uh, investigations are normal, we should suspect this pulmonary AV malformations. But what about the lungs? Were, did you was there any clue from the chest X-ray in this child? Actually, we did. Uh, this is actually we have uh, this patient was admitted uh, three months back actually, and we did a X-ray. There was a few homogeneous uh, opacity seen on the left lung, and other lung uh, was normal. But and uh, clinically there was no added sound actually, uh, and uh, as the patient uh, uh, we uh, as the patient has severely sinused and uh, if uh, it's due to the cause of lung cause, uh, the sinus is not so obvious that it become to twenty four percent or forty percent. As the patient situation was twenty four percent, so we have uh, it's our, uh, come to our mind that this uh, this sinus is not due to the lung cause. Uh, so we have done the echo and uh, found just uh, echo, it's uh, positive for the, which has to the PM. So just thinking from a general pediatrician's point of view, uh, I think if a case like this comes to a general pediatrician with the uh, echo normal, with the cardiac investigations normal, but with this kind of a chest X-ray, maybe most people would do just a normal CT thorax. Would, would you get a hint at what was happening from a CT thorax? Uh, with, with contrast, usually, probably. CT, con CT thorax with contrast, would you know? Would you get the diagnosis? Or you actually, would actually, actually, the sinuses uh, for only for uh, sinuses for the lung cause. The saturation will be, uh, sinuses will be mild. So, uh, so if uh, there is sinus is uh, more than mild and uh, lungs uh, examination of the lungs is uh, uh, is normal and the metabolic uh, the blood gas shows that there is a uh, respiratory acidosis. No, there is no respiratory acidosis. Then we can do the city. Okay. Yeah. Do you have uh, any provisions for the MRI? Mm, yes, yes, yes. We, we have provision for MI, MRI also. I suggest to go for a uh, not CT chest with contrast, but uh, you can jolly well diagnose with the MRI chest and the cardiac uh, problems or a congenital cardiac heart disease is, are better visualized uh, because you are uh, doing this uh, angio without any dye. And you can well visualize any collateral, any block, or anywhere, anything, any thrombosis or something like that. So Hello. I would request you to go for a MRI uh, chest rather than going to the CT chest and contrast. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Also, if you if you're uh, you said you occluded the main left pulmonary artery, right? Uh, initially, we uh, actually initially we first uh, upload the uh, left lower pulmonary artery. Uh, sorry, uh, left lower mm -hmm. segmental artery. And uh, as the saturation of the uh, baby saturation was not improved, then uh, at last we uploaded the left uh, main pulmonary artery. So that means this child yeah. is uh, is on a single lung now for yeah, right. on the right on the right lung. And Function. what is the expected uh, prognosis for that? So in future, patient may need a uh, uh, new left side in future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, so go. Let us take up the next case, Shubha. Uh, so for the next case, I invite Dr. Pushpanjali. She is a second year pediatric cardiology resident. Good evening, everyone. I am presenting the case of Dr. Stenting, a big step for uh, small babies. Uh, the, uh, here, uh, a preterm baby, 1.3 kg, IUGR, admitted in a government medical college with severe sinosis. All the possible causes, uh, respiratory and other causes of sinosis were ruled out. On suspicion of uh, duct-dependent pulmonary circulation, the baby was started on protein infusion. Echocardiography done there, and it showed VST pulmonary atresia with duct-dependent pulmonary circulation. 
the baby was enrolled under the RBSK scheme for further management at NSH Harvard. Public private uh, partnership model is very important, plays important role uh, in management of these type of uh, complex congenital heart disease uh, after uh, enrollment in the RBSK scheme. Here, the parents were sent to our OPD with all details of the child for further management. In view of the low body weight uh, for doctor stenting and high chances of vascular complication, is, it was decided to shift the child once he reaches a weight of 1.8 kg. Treatment was continued at that institute and with prostaglandin and other supportive measures. Uh, weekly updates regarding the baby clinical condition were communicated uh, to us. Uh, there, uh, the baby had presumptive sepsis for which the uh, baby received IV antibiotics for seven days and the pro prostin was continued for approximately two months. The child became 1.7 kg in around two months of age and when all the peripheral excesses were exhausted, so the child was shifted to uh, NSH Havra for pri uh, prior, with prior communication and ruling out uh, uh, sepsis. On presentation, we received the baby in NICU. The baby was weighted 1.65 kg. On arrival, the baby was uh, cyanosed, having mild tachypnea, and otherwise the baby was active. On examination, heart rate was around 136 beats per minute. Peripheral pulses were palpable. Blood pressure was normal. Saturation was 78% on prostate infusion. And on auscultation, there was a continuous murmur in left intracricular area. On echo, uh, uh, we done the echo and it was suggestive of VSG pulmonary atresia with adequate size confluent branch PS, PDA dependent pulmonary circulation where the vertical ductus arises from the under surface of the arch with severe constriction of the duct at PA with good biventricular function. Uh, for initial stabilization, we kept the baby uh, under overhead warmer uh, given oxygen supplementation. Prostaglandin infusion was uh, started at 5 nanograms per kg per minute and baseline IV antibiotics were started according to the unit protocol. Uh, we sent uh, blood works uh, to rule out sepsis, uh, organ dysfunction and other blood, uh, other blood for which are the prerequisite for the cardiac catheterization. Uh, we have two modalities for this uh, baby. One was rectal stenting and another was the neonatal VT shed. We went with ductus stenting as it is less invasive, require lesser duration of stay in the ICU, uh, and uh, there is a better uh, and symmetric gro uh, growth of the branch PA occur after the ductus stenting. For ductus stenting, we stripped the baby to the cath lab uh, and electively intubated the baby and mechanically ventilated. There are two approaches for ductus stenting. One is axillary approach and another is the femoral approach. We went with the axillary artery approach. With axillary artery access, PDA was crossed with coronary wires and appropriate size uh, stent deployed over it. Post procedure, the position and the flow was confirmed by the angiogram. In this first angiogram, uh, it is showing the coronary guide wire, which is present in the ventricle, and the sheet, which is present in the axillary artery. We could not be able to negate the uh, sheet up to the arch, uh, up to arch because of the small caliber of the vessel as the baby was uh, very small, 1.65 kg. In the second angiogram, we, uh, we can see the coronary guide wire in the uh, branch pulmonary artery and the stent in the uh, PDA. And in third and final angiogram, it is... Uh, and the stent position was confirmed and the, uh, both aortic and the pulmonary end of the stent is uh, covered while uh, there is good flow in the bilateral branch PAs. Post-procedure, uh, the baby was shifted back to the NICU on multiple inotropes, adrenaline, noradrenaline and milrinon, which were gradually tapered. Heparin infusion was started to maintain the stent flow, uh, which later on uh, uh, the baby was shifted on eco spin once, uh, once the feeding was established. Diuretics was given to maintain the uh, overflow, uh, manage the overflow situation. Mechanical ventilation continued for 24 hours with frequent blood gas monitoring. Blood transfusion was given as there was acute blood loss during the procedure. Baby was extubated after 24 hours of the invasive mechanical ventilation to an IV gradually being to room here, had vascular complication of left upper lip with pulselessness and some discoloration of skin, which was managed conservatively with prolonged heparin infusion. Gradually, the feeding was established and baby was roomed in with mother and discharged on day eight of the admission. 
at the time of discharge baby was clinically stable and the uh, room air saturation was 82 percent we will follow up the baby uh, closely and will look for the growth of the branch pH and saturation during the follow up and this child will require open heart surgery in form of PSD closure and RB2 PA conduit placement at later date. Uh, the status of neonatal ductus stenting under RBSK uh, public private partnership model in our institute. All the neonates after cardiac diagnosis can get enrolled under Shishu Sati Prakalp at SSKM Hospital, Medical College Kolkata, Arjikar, and NRS Medical College. Expert teams in these hospitals decide whom and where to refer these neonates depending on the criticalness of the cardiac lesion. These neonates get shifted to the partner hospital with prior communication for further management. 15% of the cardiac uh, congenital heart disease are critical and need treatment within one year of life. 41, uh, 41 doctor stenting were done in 2022 under RBSK scheme in our hospital. Early diagnosis and robust enrollment under the government scheme can ensure their treatment at an affordable cost. In year 2022, uh, our institute has done 41 ductus stenting cases and uh, the smallest uh, uh, neonate being 1.9 kg. Take home messages start a prostaglandin infusion in all babies who are blue and not responding to oxygen therapy after ruling out a respiratory cause. Appropriate NICU care of such low birth baby is necessary prior to undergoing any procedure in the cardiac center. Proper referral and cross referral are the major key, which is critical for the outcome of the procedure. Doctor stenting provide a crucial bridging time required for definitive surgical correction later in the life. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for Dr. Pushpanjali? Uh, hello. Yeah, Kalpana. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so Dr. Kalpana here. So, uh, I didn't uh, hear about the first case that this is a very good case. And uh, my question to her is uh, what was the weight of when the baby is discharged? Was there any improvement in the weight? Because no, it was quite uh, low, what weight, 1.3 something she has said. No, ma'am. Uh, um, the baby stayed with us for around 10 days, but there was no. Oh, 10 days only. Okay. Okay. So, so what, no is the, uh, what was the final diagnosis in the case? Ma'am, VSD pulmonary atresia with uh, period dependent uh, pulmonary circulation. So, VSD with the pulmonary atresia, was there any changes in the right ventricle and all? No, ma'am. Uh, at present, there was no changes in the right ventricle as the baby is only two months old. Okay, okay. Okay. That's good. Nice case. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, okay. There is no more question from my side. Anyone can ask the question. And uh, Dr. Atunu, I think yeah. uh, Sushmita is there and she can be one of the judges. And she is, from, is there from the very beginning. So, Sushmita, I think you will be one of the judges because you are here from the beginning. Huh? All right, madam. If there are no more questions okay. for us, then we will move on to our next case. For our next okay. case, I will be inviting Dr. Meenal Desai. She is a first year BNB pediatric president. Good afternoon, everyone. My topic for today is the perils of hypokalemia, snatching life from death. So at the outset, this might seem like a presentation just about hypokalemia. But uh, with my presentation, I would like to elicit how its early recognition and rapid treatment is essential. Otherwise, it can lead to a catastrophe. So I'll uh, start by giving a patient overview. Um, we had a four-month-old baby girl with a five-day history of fever, cough, and multiple episodes of loose stool and vomiting. And she was admitted at a local hospital for all the above complaints and was receiving supportive treatment. Um, on examination at that hospital, she was found to have severe hypokalemia, around one millimole, at, and it was being corrected only through a peripheral cannula. So in view of the above and the persistent hypokalemia, she suffered a cardiac arrest at that hospital with a downtime of around 20 minutes before ROSC was achieved. And uh, once the patient stabilized, she was brought to our, uh, brought to our hospital with a potassium level of 1.5. So I will start with the past medical history. 
Uh, she's been having these recurrent episodes of diarrhea, skin rash, cold and cough even in the past, but they used to resolve with uh, home treatment. And uh, she was delivered by LUCS. Her mother had GDM, but uh, it was well controlled throughout the pregnancy. She was on insulin. And otherwise, the pregnancy and birth was uneventful. The baby cried at birth. Uh, natal and postnatal period was uneventful. She has been completely immunized. Development is according to the age appropriate milestones. She's on mixed feeding. Uh, she has a five-year-old sister, but uh, the sister has no significant medical past history and the mother has no history of miscarriage, abortion or any healthy family disorder. So when the child arrived, these were the clinical findings uh, which we observed. So she was intubated and on PRVC mode, um, her FIO2 requirement was around 0.5 with a PEEP of 5, and she was maintaining her saturation in mid-90s. Her chest x-ray was reasonable. Um, her heart was structurally normal. IVC collapsibility was greater than 50%, and her pe uh, pedal pulses were weak. Her MAP on NIVP was in the low 40s, and she had a severe extravasation injury on her left leg. I don't think this picture does complete justice to it. It was uh, much more severe than this, but this is all we have. And apart from that, she also had areas of patchy discoloration on her right leg due to attempts at femoral arterial puncture for doing ABG. She was intermittently waking up. A sensorium was um, acceptable. So how we started managing her, her initial assessment, uh, sorry, her initial management, uh, we corrected the hypokalemia first. We gained a central venous access in the inter right internal jugular vein. We started potassium infusion at the rate of 0.5 mini equivalents per kg per hour under ECG and 4 hourly VPG monitoring. And this hypokalemia then went on to resolve in the next 12 hours. We gave her a good antibiotic coverage after sending all the cultures. We uh, started with a NORAD support of uh, 0 0.05 mics per kg and uh, total fluid intake uh, around 70%, raw calcium at 0.8 ml per hour and all other relevant investigations including chest x-ray and management of metabolic acidosis was done. Subsequently, uh, we noticed that her uh, on the next day that her uh, liver function was grossly deranged her liver enzymes were in the range of six thousands and apart from that she was also having recurrent episodes of hyperglycemia hyperkalemia lactic acidosis and elevated INR. but she had no active bleeding or ascites and her liver function was um, uh, sorry her liver size was normal on usg so this is her INR level around 3.32 so uh, thinking about the possible etiologies, it could be um, a viral case because AST was much greater than ALT. It could be ischemic because uh, her downtime was quite high. She had a, a cardiac arrest for around 20 minutes. And uh, it could be a metabolic disorder also, which could have been precipitated by the illness. So the intervention which we took, we started an n acetylcysteine infusion because it has an antioxidant and vasodilator effect. Uh, we gave a cryoprecipitate and albumin transfusion. We gave her L-carnitin therapy. We sent uh, her blood for metabolic and sepsis screen, and we started monitoring her electrolytes, LFT, and blood glucose daily. Uh, to <laughs> hypoglycemia, we also gave her a continuous de uh, dextrose infusion along with NG feeds, and we were neurologically monitoring her for raised ICP or seizures. So along the course of management, her liver function showed improvement over the next six days, but her IMD panel, it revealed that she has short-chain fatty acid, uh, poic dehydrogenase deficiency. Further course of management. So we extubated the child after five days on NIV. Uh, however, she needed reintubation next day due to increased work of breathing and respiratory acidosis. This is the child on NIV. So then we started uh, with our next new concern, which was new infiltrates in the right lower zone on the chest X-ray, her FiO2 requirements started increasing. Her inflammatory markers, as you can see, ferritin was around 2,450. And her CRP also started increasing. Her D-dimer was in the range of 7,000, but her hemodynamics remained stable throughout. So again, we thought about the poss uh, possible etiology and... Uh, 
it could be a case of ventilator associated pneumonia in context of this acute sick state so uh, we consulted with our infectious disease team and we updated the antibiotics to zavisaftastrinam polymyxin b and colistinib pneumonia biofires were sent and we uh, further restricted her fluids during the course of management her inflammatory markers uh, showed a gradual downtrend the pneumonia biofires were show uh, so were positive for e coli h influenza human enterovirus and they were oxa 48 and ctxm resistant and the lung opacity started uh, showing a resolution and we successfully extubated her this time to hhfnc which was gradually weaned and then we uh, deescalated the antibiotics the next concern in view of the cardiac arrest which she had in the uh, local hospital was aki so her creatinine started rising and she had hyponatremia in the range of 172 175 and her creatinine was 1.48 1.78 1.71 1 but she was non oliguric her urine output was around 0.5 to 1 ml per kg per hour so again the possible etiology was a pre renal cause of aki because it could be due to a post cardiac arrest or some component of dehydration because idc was well collapsible and it could be due to sepsis or uh, nephrotoxic uh, drug related so the intervention we took was uh, we started optimizing our fluids uh we placed an uh, peritoneal uh, catheter and we started dialysis and we increased free water allowance in view of hyponatremia we sent relevant investigations like usg kub urine analysis electrolyte serology we managed the infections we uh, altered the doses of all nephrotoxic drugs we maintained the map in around 50s to 60s to maintain good organ perfusion we transfused albumin and during the course of treatment uh, she received 6 days of peritoneal dialysis with gradual decline in her renal parameters good electrolyte balance was achieved and she uh, started tolerating her feeds well and then she went into the polyuric phase with the resolution of aki in a week so this is the placement of the uh, pd catheter the other supportive care we gave her a ct brain it showed a thin sdh along the right occipital lobe convexity and the right temporium and a thin subdural hygroma along the bilateral frontal lobe convexity but her uh, neuro uh, neurological examination was um, quite appropriate and she was waking up with no focal neuro deficit uh, we started taking care of her burns injury with gelonet and tbac ointment dressing uh we are very strict about this in our pico that we handle all central venous accesses in a completely sterile way and uh we uh, care of the indwelling catheter was done to check for its patency and flow rate we roomed in with the mother when the child stabilized and we trained her regarding the ng feeds because she had a poor suck reflex and uh, we trained the mother how to take care of a sick, uh, sick child and we ensured prevention of exposure keratotic So conclusion, uh, follow up management post discharge. So currently her NG tube has been removed and she's on oral feeds. We sent a clinical exome study to confirm the diagnosis of scar deficiency. We counseled the parents regarding the mon uh, modification of diet in the future in view of scar deficiency, along with addition of riboflavin and carnitine supplements. And we started early intervention therapy and neurodevelopmental follow up. And so far, neuro uh, neurologically she's intact. Her beta was normal. and we did a plastic surgery referral following the uh, extravasation injury so learnings from the case first of all critical hypokalemia less than 2.7 uh, millimoles it is a very dangerous entity and it should be treated rapidly with a central venous access we must take care of our iv cannulation sites which check for thrombosis and knowledge about the drug dosage limits in peripheral and central venous access to prevent burn injuries and good organ support and a multidisciplinary approach in the pico can be very rewarding in a child post cardiac arrest this is the family taking the baby back home and this is the current condition of her burns injury she has developed good granulation tissue but she needs further care thank you Okay, so 
if anyone wants to place any question, Sushmita Di, Kalpana Di, ha, Sushmita Di, please. So uh, just a quick comment. Um, I think uh, inborn error of metabolism, the answer comes back a little bit late, right? So yes. it has been, uh, first of all, it's an excellent case, very well managed. So congratulations for that. Um, but when we are actively dealing with the case to, you know, from the nephrology point of view, what comes to mind is that this was a child with hypokalemia and metabolic uh, acidosis, right? Uh, so right in the beginning, it would have been nice to see uh, a little bit of work up what the differential diagnosis of that is, was uh, urine and serum anion gap done, which could have given a clue right at that moment, uh, right in the early phase also, whether it was a metabolic defect or whether it was a renal defect. So I think that is one point I wanted to make. And second, any um, any history of consanguinity in this child? Mm -hmm. No. And third is um, uh, uh, something that we have been from uh, from the renal pediatrician's point of view, we have been saying for a long time is that these um, critical patients who are coming into PICU with severe uh, hypovolemia due to whatever cause, we, uh, you know, one of the initial things to look at is the nephrotoxic drugs. Uh, mm -hmm. Even if they are not in AKI, we do not want to expose them to nephrotoxic drugs. So maybe that is a take-home message as well. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ma Thank so, you. Uh, and Shubhadeep? Yeah. So uh, for our last case, I yeah. invite Dr. Richa Sivasta, and she is a CTVS trainee. Yeah. It's not here. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to my presentation. I am Dr. Richa Srivastava, uh, CTVS trainee at RM Tagore Hospital. As you can see uh, from my screen, my topic for today is I am invincible and I will win every single game. Uh, by the end of this presentation, uh, I hope I can convince you to agree with my topic. So let's begin with a nine-month-old 7-kg male baby who... Uh, who uh, had come with a late presentation of transposition of great arteries with intact interventricular septum in a status post balloon atrial septostomy at one month of age and was admitted for a Senex procedure. A detailed preoperative echocardiogram revealed the diagnosis of ascites inversus dextrocardia BTGA with intact interventricular septum with a large 11 mm uh, ostium secundum ASD and a regressed delta. So let's talk about what is a Senning or procedure or a mustard procedure. The name comes from its inventor, A. Senning, a Swedish uh, surgeon who first performed the surgery. It involves the creation of a baffle that diverts the venous drainage into the respective ventricles at atrial level. And it is basically the physiological restoration of a normal flow of blood at atrial level with heart and lung being in series. We had taken this patient up for a Senning's procedure. We came off uh, cardiopulmonary bypass with 0.5 mics per kg of adrenaline and noradrenaline each and 0.5 mics uh, per kg per minute of uh, mildrenone. But the CVP was ranging uh, 15 to 20 mm Hg. Post-operative transesophageal eco done uh, showed no turbulence in the pulmonary and systemic venous baffle and my left ABVR and a good biventricular function. As you can see from the X-ray on post-operative day zero, uh, the X-ray looks appears okay, and he was shifted to the ITU. During the ITU course, the pedal pulses were palpable, uh, and the baby had sinus rhythm, heart rate between 180 to 200 per minute. Mean pressures were high in the high 40s to the low 50s, and the CVP ranges between 15 to 20. Initial lactate was around 4.5, and mixed venous saturation was 55%. The cardiac monitors on the right uh, shows the mean pressures uh, first been 46 and then going down to 41, but it eventually went down and down. Over the next four hours, uh, continue to have borderline hemodynamics, persistent tachycardia and dropping levels of urine output. Uh, on echocardiography, there was biventricular dysfunction with dilated IVCs, as you can see, and mean pressures were down to 30 to 40 mm Hg. We also started with peritoneal dialysis uh, in view of dropping levels of urine. 
He was initiated on levosimentin and other inotropes were escalated to norad being uh, at 0.2 mics per kg per minute, vasopressin at 0.7, and at adrenaline at 0.15 mics per kg per minute. However, the patient continued to have severe low cardiac output state and became aneuric. The chest X-ray showed development of pulmonary edema and lactate increased to 9 with mixed venous saturation going down to 30s and worsening metabolic acidosis. So now we were dealing with four, four problems, the development of pulmonary edema, the acute kidney injury, uh, by, uh, which was marked by increasing levels of creatinine and uh, dropping levels of urine, low cardiac output, as you can see on the cardiac monitor, the mean pressures were 28, and systemic inflammatory re, uh, response syndrome. On the left, uh, the image shows of a, uh, there's a development of pulmonary edema, as you can see in the chest x-ray below. So, decision to initiate the patient to a veno arterial ECMO was done, and a 14 French biomedical straight venous cannula was used for venous drainage through left IGV, which was performed by the intensivist, and a 12 French bi biomedical straight cannula was used for aortic return, and a 12 DLP angled cannula was placed in the right superior pulmonary vein to LA to vent the left ventricle after opening the chest performed by the cardiac surgeon. So, on the left is the ECMO setup. And on the right, you can see the X-ray of uh, the child after after cannulating. Initial ECMO setting uh, were as follows: flow of 100 ml per kg per minute. ACT target was 180 to 220 seconds. Hemofiltration at 20 ml per hour, and the ventilator ventilator setting was pressure control mode 20 by 10 with respiratory rate at 15 per minute and FiO2 of 0.4. Uh, the patient was sedated. Uh, with dexmetodomidin and uh, morphine and paralyzed as and when needed. It was, the patient was also covered with ceftarolin and levofloxacin and blood and urine cultures were sent. Events while on ECMO, the hemodynamic parameters and the endocrine function remained stable. Lactate levels normalized and uh, mixed venous saturation was reasonable. There was development of facial puffiness and this was in the context of development of clot in the venous line and inadequate venous drainage. This resolved when the clots were removed under direct vision, as you can see on the image above, and daily assessment of suitability to wean was done. There was some gradual improvement in the biventricular function, as you can see in the ECO recording. So this was the uh, image of the baby uh, having facial puffiness. And the child was supported on ECMO for 48 hours and he was decannulated and the chest was closed. Patient was on moderate inotropic support and CVP had improved and then was between 8 to 10 mm of Hg. Cultures were negative. He was extubated after three days on NIV and patient maintained status quo on NIV for next several days. His inotrope supports were gradually reduced and respiratory support was weaned down. Uh, we thought that everything was falling in place. When on post-operative day 24, the sternal wound was found to be gaping with discharge. However, sternum was stable. Wound swab cultures were sent and antibiotics were upgraded. However the, however, the cultures were negative and the baby continued to be oligo and muric and was on peritoneal dialysis. The USG showed bilateral grade 2 renal parenchymal disease. With peritoneal dialysis, creatinine had stabilized between 1 to 8, 1.8 to 2 mg percent, and there was no metabolic acidosis and electrolytes were normal. There has been gradual improvement in the overall condition of the baby. He is hemodynamically stable and, and on 0.5 liters per minute nasal cannula oxygen and maintaining a saturation in high 90s. He is partly NG fed and partly orally fed. Wound is much better with daily dressing and there is a healthy granulation tissue formation. He has started to make some urine from a state of anuria, which gives us hope. And we have changed his stiff PD catheter to tunnel Tenchkov catheter, as you can see on the image on the right. And we have trained the parents in handling the peritoneal dialysis catheter and have arranged for a continuation of home PD. We will be discharging him tomorrow on home oxygen at 0.5 liters per minute. However, prolonged home supportive therapy and follow up will continue. The use of ECMO, short for an extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, does the work of the heart and the lung and throw a, li a lifeline to those who otherwise would not have made it. At NSH Havra, uh, the team of doctors have been performing ECMO in the ITU settings. And uh, I'm also glad to announce that NSH Havra is an ELSO registered ECMO center. 
my take away message uh, would be the post operative period in status post selling procedure can be very rocky but a strong ito management can be very rewarding i would like to conclude by saying the baby did not lose hope and so did we thank you okay so thank you bicha it's my pleasure to have my student to present cases which were my student in uh, holdia imzar so it's yes. my sheer pleasure to listen to you i was listening throughout thank you sir so uh, we had a fair idea of ecmo we had been hearing about it a long time but i think not all units have this facility still now so i would like a parting comment from shubhadeep before you we end up i think uh, i would like to congratulate all our uh, all our fellows uh, who did an excellent job and stop spent a lot stop of time sharing for... shubhadeep stop sharing yes yes uh, and uh, they spent a lot of time and put a lot of effort in making all these presentations so i would like to congratulate all of them and all of the presentations according to me they were very good and uh, thank you everybody for your patient hearing and also apologies for the technical glitches in the initial part uh, but i think everything at the end went well yeah so that was a good presentation and interesting and from a point where you did not have a clinical meeting beforehand so this is the second of this month thanks to professor shapun ray who is been uh, steering it since january two clinical meetings a month one on the offline mode and one on the online mode so uh, would be happy that if, uh, i think uh, if the attendance would have been a bit better and i would look uh, request professor shapun ray to look into it again and also i request shubhadeep and shapun to uh, find out the results of this after and place it in the wbf office over to shapun ray so actually we will uh, convey the results later uh, uh, so i'll just first congratulate uh, dr shubhadeep das for mentoring the whole session and all the uh, presenter those who have pre presented uh, the cases and uh, and i am giving you a invitations that howra pedicon is going to happen on the 9th of april so please do join professor sujit singh from uh, chandni pj chandigarh is uh, will be delivering the manas mukaji memorial orations so please come this is my open invitation to all so shushmita are you there so we'll convey the result later uh, uh, sure okay sure okay so thank you okay. and thank you good night everybody bye see you